much. Thanks so much. Very kind introduction. <laughs> Not sure I deserved it, but thank you. Well, I think you were prepared for anything because I see tennis shoes, so you could be running off the stage. Right. Um, nothing, nothing to fear here. Uh, there's, there's a lot to discuss, and I have a few things I wanted to talk about with you. Um, but, of course, feel free to elaborate. You've got a lot to talk about over the, the period of your, your tenure. But I'd like to start with a definition, if you don't mind, which is what in the world is a comptroller and why did you want to be one? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great question. Uh, the Comptroller is the Chief Fiscal Officer of the state. You mentioned some of the responsibilities. Maryland has a unique uh, office. It's, it's unlike any other state, frankly, as far as the Comptroller position, so I'm lucky to have the job. But uh, I didn't really want the job because uh, you mentioned I was in the legislature for 20 years, and at the end of that 20 years, uh, I was basically ready to get out, but I couldn't voluntarily retire because there were so many perks in the job. So I was like, <laughs> I, I uh, subcommittee chair in appropriations. I helped get the money to build this wonderful Strathmore Music Center. And, Can we and, have some applause know. for that? <laughs> Thank you. So I wanted to get out because I'd just been there too long, but I couldn't because there was people holding doors, et cetera, and saying Mr. Chairman and all that. So I decided to run against William Donald Schaefer, who at that point was a iconic four-term mayor of the city of Baltimore, two-term governor, and was running for re-election to his third term as comptroller. So I figured that would be a good way to exit gracefully. I would run against him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, I ended up, to everyone's surprise, including my own, winning. And uh, that uh, allowed me to come into the position basically with a blank slate. I just, I was the accidental comptroller. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, I luckily had Doug Duncan, who was the county executive here in Montgomery County, he served on my transition committee and he said, Peter, look, you've never run anything in your life. You're a great guy, you're very smart, but you are not qualified right now to be comptroller. So he strongly recommended for the first six months, just go and talk to your employees and tell them that you're going to have their back and that you're going to get the support they need. And uh, that was tremendous advice because at the end of the six months, I had a little bit of concept and vision as to what I might contribute to uh, the state of Maryland through that office. Now, you're, you, you said you were having these meetings with this kind of you know, tripartite group every couple of weeks, which is really important. You can sit down together and discuss ideas. So is that, is that over, uh, let's say, a craft beer? Or uh, <laughs> how are you um, how well, are You, you brought up a tricky subject. <laughs> I am the chief alcohol <laughs> regulator, uh, and uh, so I developed over the years a real knowledge about uh, microbreweries and craft beer breweries in, in Maryland, uh, and we have about a hundred of them now. They represent about a billion dollars in economic activity, but wow. more importantly, they are producing great product, hiring our uh, Maryland citizens for their employees, and they act as kind of a magnet for millennials around the country who really like uh, these craft alcohol products. Uh, they're not cheap, uh, but the uh, expertise and innovation is uh, extraordinary. So I decided to try to get rid of the prohibition era restraints mm. that had been placed on the craft breweries by the big out-of-state breweries. This is you know, okay. economics big 101, you have economic power, you're going to make sure you're protected. So. They had a million different provisions about uh, what these poor craft brewers in Maryland could do, how much beer they could produce, uh, how they could sell it or not sell it, who they had to use for distributors. So it was a real impediment to their growth. We proposed all sorts of reforms. Uh, the legislature thankfully passed a lot of them this last session, uh, but they also decided to punish me on the way out by stripping me of the authority to regulate alcohol. <laughs> Only in Annapolis could you see this. Uh, but you can still buy it. They I, just won't yes, let I you regulate see, it. Yes, exactly. Okay. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's a fabulous manufacturing sec uh, sector. Yesterday I was in Baltimore cutting the ribbon on uh, Mobtown Brewery wow. 
in yeah. old Brewers Hill. Sure. Where was it located? It was located in an abandoned manufacturing factory for Westinghouse Electric, which had just wow. been vacant for decades. And now there's this wonderful brewery, which is a, uh, uh, has a uh, kind of gathering place for young people with their families, because they have these tap rooms that are very uh, modern and, and uh, you know, uh, they don't sell other people's alcohol. They sure. They're only allowed to sell their own beer, and their beer is very creative. Right. So we're substituting a new uh, modern manufacturing sector for the old uh, manufacturing sector that has left parts of downtown Baltimore. That makes me very happy. I'm very pleased for them, and uh, the legislature and I will have to settle uh, down the road <laughs> what exactly is going on with the regulation? It's kind of funny in a way because um, obviously among your many responsibilities is, uh, I guess, oversight of and, and uh, counting the dollars. It's revenue for the state. Those craft brewers are, are bringing it not just jobs and development, like you said, with the old Westinghouse plant, but it's also, it's revenue. Yeah, not to get too wonky, but every beer that's bought in a craft brewer in Maryland produces two and a half times the economic activity and benefit to the state that an out-of-state uh, Bud Light or Miller Light. Wow. Well, I shouldn't mention those names because I don't <laughs> want anybody <laughs> to drink that now. stuff. It's terrible. So, uh, right. yeah. yeah, their beer tastes terrible, and they are also uh, have a stranglehold on the legislature. So, uh, uh, but the out-of-state breweries are now kind of, there's kind of a level playing field, uh, which is all these craft brewers need. When they get their... Uh, uh, hands on the process, they can innovate and, and uh, create entrepreneurial activity that is far more positive for the state than the uh, out-of-state uh, breweries. Absolutely, and, and that's micro and macro economic activity. So there's money being brought to the state, but it's also a lot of jobs, and then that must be providing a model, I guess, for other people who want to start businesses. So there are kind of a couple of questions in there, and one is those forces that try to um, help the out-of-state, uh, uh, you know, competing beer companies, let's say, over perhaps some of the uh, efforts that were being made to foster um, local beer production and craft beers. I wonder if those same kinds of forces are at play as all of you together work to bring in or foster other kinds of developing businesses in the state. So what are the forces that are keeping small businesses back? What's the vision that's going to help them move yeah. forward in that environment? I call them the forces of evil, okay? Because... <laughs> Every legislature probably has this problem, but we particularly have one down in Annapolis where my party, the Democrats, have had an overwhelming lockstep uh, hold on uh, veto-proof majorities, mm -hmm. in effect, for decades. And uh, there's that old phrase, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Mm -hmm. It does. I've been there. I've seen yeah. it. Uh, the beer uh, issue that you brought up was just one small example of where the authority is abused on behalf of, not policy, but on behalf of uh, special interests from outside mm. the state. And we're wrestling with that a little bit right now. Um, when I first became comptroller, I launched into this exercise of customer service uh, and dealing with uh, Marylanders very honestly and directly and competently as far as the collection of taxes and refunds and Board of Public Works and all that stuff. Now I'm getting into uh, a, what I think is a more important uh, visionary battle, which is uh, trying to uh, create a concept of honest, ethical, accountable, good government, separate from these old-fashioned, smoke-filled backroom Democratic or Republican clubhouses where uh, people out of sight uh, made decisions that affected the states mm -hmm voters and taxpayers in a negative way, but they never were held accountable. Mm -hmm. So the idea of opening up that process and making it more transparent uh, is now what I'm focused on, and I think uh, it's going to get a very good response from the public. You know, I and, know and not to puff mm -hmm. my own or aggrandize myself too mm -hmm. much, I actually am someone that understands what it is that I'm talking about because I've lived it, I've experienced it. Uh, I now have a very important statewide 
elected position, so I'm not just someone going down and begging crumbs off the table. I'm right. going to go down with a big broom if I am successful down the road, uh, and I'm going to make it a better process. Not so much for Republicans, necessarily, because mm -hmm. I tell my Republican friends, you guys are susceptible to the same thing, which is this misuse of too much concentration of power. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm kind of, uh, yeah, it's exciting for me because uh, the bottom line is good government. It, you know, when you talk about concentration of power, um, there's another concentration that a lot of us talk about, we've been talking about for years, and that's concentration of wealth and income. And I know that's affecting us here in Maryland, it's affecting us across the country. We talk about it endlessly, ceaselessly. But I'm wondering, especially now that you've just seen all the tax receipts, I mean, we just all paid our taxes. Um, what is your vision, if you have one? What's the vision you're trying to bring to this next generation of people after you clean house and sweep house for trying to address this persistent problem of wealth and income inequality? Well, number one, we almost half of the corporations in the state of Maryland that make profits pay no tax at all, zero tax, because mm -hmm. you know they and their owners have figured out how to game the system. It's legal. I'm not suggesting it's illegal, but it borders on unethical because these companies, uh, like uh, Amazon, for example, are enormously wealthy. Mm -hmm. They're also very good, uh, but they're flawed because A, they don't pay taxes, and B, they destroy small businesses mm -hmm. all over the state as a result of their efficiency and their, you know, mo their business model. So number one, we need to look at corporations and make sure that everybody is being uh, taxed fairly and not being allowed to get away with things. On the individual side, that's a little more difficult because you're dealing with uh, capitalism and uh, this quirky system of free enterprise, as I call it, that has a certain genius to it because it allows us to have prosperity, but it also has this flaw of concentration, as you say. I'm not exactly sure how you address uh, that concentration of wealth in a small number of individuals. First of all, they've managed, because of their wealth, to build these moats around mm -hmm. their fortunes that make it very difficult uh, legally to get at them. Right. Uh, especially at the state level, I guess. Right? Especially at the state level is, uh, yeah, well, Washington's no great uh, <laughs> leveler of equality, uh, no, no great uh, haven of equality right now, but mm -hmm. Maryland, like most legislatures, uh, the uh, corporate and uh, wealthy individuals have an outsized influence on policy, particularly uh, policies that affect their wealth. Yeah. I'm just curious as, as kind of we, we close up, what's the unfinished business for you? What's the vision that you have that you still, unlike the things you've just mentioned, that you'd still like, you'd like to see done, not just while you're in office, but you know, the, the legacy you hand to your your children, yeah, your I have always, I've always been upset with people that uh, bully other people and uh, tell them what to do, intimidate them, uh, and make them scared enough not to be able to speak up. Uh, my work for the remainder of my tenure uh, will be to get rid of the, uh, put some checks and balances in and give it some sunlight and electrical light so that it's transparent and once it's transparent, it will be sharply reduced or be a lot more people in prison. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just... Uh, you yeah. aren't selling any books I, out I'm in the not, hall. Right, so I'm not selling any books. <laughs> but, and I don't mean to end on a gloomy note no. because I think the future of the state and the future of the country is very strong and I have a lot of confidence in the bones of democracy that we right. have. But like any state legislature, Maryland uh, can be uh, improved and they have the same problem with machine politics, uh, once again in Baltimore City, for example, where we're dealing with not just the mayor, but there are a number of other uh, scandals going on up there. So to the extent we can deliver to the voters and the citizens a more competent uh, government that has integrity, uh, that's kind of my focus for the next couple of years. And, <laughs> and if you don't mind, just one last little one. Yeah. You mentioned millennials before and their aptitude for, you know, drinking craft beer, but millennials have a lot of 
a lot of uh, great qualities, as you well know. Um, I'm wondering, uh, when you look at, let's say, people under 40, there's a lot of different generations there. Um, what is it that we can do to ensure that they feel like they're a part of this change that you're trying to enact? Well, um, we have to get rid of the, uh, some of the labels. My own son it lives out in San Francisco. He's very successful. He makes more money in a month than I make in a year, but God bless him. But you would think he would be a natural Democrat. He isn't because of the fiscal policies of, the, uh, of, of what he perceives as my party's flaws. He's certainly not a Republican. So I think a lot of millennials are not happy with the uh, uh, identities that have been, uh, that are before them to choose. And I think uh, if we could get rid of uh, a lot of these uh, restrictions as to who can vote, when they can vote, let people vote in different primaries. If we can ask the millennials to come into a state where we don't have a lot of political uh, clubs and political slates and political bosses, uh, mm -hmm. I think they would, along with craft beer, be very uh, interested in, <laughs> in our state. Democratize democracy. Yeah. Exactly. You, uh, I may borrow that. <laughs> it, that would be not a bad uh, bumper sticker for uh, my reelection. Thank you so much. Yeah. Comptroller Friends Show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jake.